Cocktail Sessions, educational and inspirational talks from experienced startup founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. Thank you, Frank. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out. My name is Phil Simon, and I want to talk about experts and why you shouldn't trust them. I'm going to be giving away a book. Anyone know who this is? It's very obscure. I'll be shocked if you get it. I'll give you a hint. His name's Thomas Watson. And he once said, famously, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Very nice. Give yourself a book. Come on up. Now, why should he have known better? He said this 70 years ago. Well, he wasn't some random person. In fact, as you just said, he happened to be, at the time, the president of a little company called IBM. He was an expert. He should have known better, but his prediction wasn't right. And today, I'm going to talk about how that's actually a very common thing. But what is an expert? Oxford English Dictionary defines it as, and I quote, a person who is very knowledgeable about or skillful in a particular area. Now, note that that does not mean that an expert is always right, nor does it mean that an expert is particularly good at predicting the future. Okay? Experts are often wrong, and I've got some great examples today uh, from business, but also from movies and music. But first, let's kind of take it up a level. Now, you're probably wondering right now, who is Philip Tetlock and why should I care? Philip Tetlock did a really interesting study. He's a university professor at Pennsylvania, and he studies psychology. And he looked at 284 experts over 25 years across a wide range of different fields. He looked at journalists, professors, politicians, government officials. He looked at people on the left, Marxists. He looked at people on the right, libertarians. He looked at 28,000 predictions over a quarter of a century. And he realized that experts were wrong in their predictions roughly 50% of the time. They didn't do better than monkeys. It was literally a coin flip. He also found that the more people made predictions, the worse off they are. They actually got worse at predicting the future. So Philip Tetlock wrote a book about it. There have been a lot of books written about this subject. Anyone here of Nate Silver, 538, political pundit, Silver and the Noise? Excellent book, I highly recommend it. The Signal and the Noise, Why Most Predictions Fail But Some Don't. It's very difficult to predict the future. Okay. David Freeman wrote a book called Wrong, Same General Principle. There are all sorts of reasons that experts are often wrong. So that's what I'm going to talk about at a high level. But I've got some great examples. I thought I'd give the book away with this one. I did not think anyone would get Thomas Watson. But who's this? Oh, come on. Breaking Bad. <laughs> Breaking Bad. Give me a name. Vince Gilligan. Vince Gilligan. Beautiful. Breaking Bad is my favorite TV show. The history behind this show is amazing. Vince Gilligan had just finished up doing a couple of episodes of The X-Files. And he was maybe 39, 40 years old at the time. It was about seven years ago. So he was talking to one of his writing partners about the next move. And he came up with the idea about a show by the name of Breaking Bad about a guy named Walter White, a 50-year-old high school chemistry teacher with a son, teenager, with cerebral palsy, a wife with a surprise baby, and he finds out he has terminal lung cancer and six months to live. He wants to provide for his family. The show at a high level is about what a man will do to provide for his family. Well, with a title like Breaking Bad, and he needs a lot of money in a short period of time as a trained chemist, he starts manufacturing crystal meth. Not sort of your normal show. So Vince Gilligan pitches it to HBO, the experts, right? And they say, are you kidding, right? 50-year-old guy with cancer, middle age? You've got to be crazy. FX also said, nah, now nah, we'll pass. The funny thing is, in subsequent interviews, Vince Gilligan has said, if I were them, I would have done the same thing. I would have passed on my own show. But eventually, AMC said, yeah, what the hell, we'll give it a run. <laughs> I dare you to watch the first five minutes of the first show in the first season of Breaking Bad and not wonder how the hell it ends. It's just, it's like a drug. It is like meth. <laughs> Breaking Bad 
I would argue is the greatest show in the history of television, but don't listen to me. It's won a ridiculous number of awards. Primetime Emmy Awards, Golden Globe. Brian Cranston says that he's 57 years old now. He was, used to be in Malcolm in the Middle. He used to be on Seinfeld as the dentist, Tim Watley. He felt very strongly that this is his career role. He has more work now than he can handle, and he's entering his more senior years. So Vince Gilligan didn't listen to the experts. I think we're stuck again. That's fine. This is not cooperating. Oh, should I do that? That's cool. I'll just do that. Okay. Please tell me you recognize these people. <laughs> Michael Richards, Jason Alexander, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, and the man, Jerry Seinfeld. Seinfeld had been a stand-up comedian, and he had an idea for a show about nothing with Larry David, who you may know from Curb Your Enthusiasm. It was literally a show about nothing. Nothing was supposed to happen. In an episode of Seinfeld, they literally sit in a Chinese restaurant waiting for a table for 22 minutes. And at that point, Seinfeld had said, I know we got something here, because when we can make a show like this work, we can do anything. But the first six episodes of Seinfeld had dismal ratings. In fact, it was called the Seinfeld Chronicles, and NBC, which had picked up the show for six episodes, had basically said, we're done here, right? We, this is pointless, right? It really is this bad. But there was one VP at NBC that said, I don't care. This is different. These guys are on to something. Seinfeld will probably be in syndication for the rest of our lives. It has won, again, very many awards. TV Guide named it once the greatest show of all time. It's won Emmys. It's launched all these careers. It's brought so many things like Spunsworthy into the vernacular. Seinfeld has been an iconic show. It's hard for me to imagine a world without Seinfeld. I waste more time watching Seinfeld because I can't watch just two minutes of it. So again, the experts were wrong. This is my favorite band, Rush. I actually spoke at an Inspire event about Rush and how they've inspired me as a writer to take risks and to bet on myself. And Rush has been around now for 39 years. I actually went on April 18th to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Los Angeles to watch the induction, and it was hysterical. They have it on HBO, but it's completely butchered. For instance, when the head of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame walked on stage, he had reportedly kept Rush out of the hall for 19 years. He was booed for a good two minutes. They edited out of the clip. Rush has been phenomenally successful, despite the fact that the experts said, you guys have no shot. They had no love early on from radio. Now, admittedly, Rush's music is a little eclectic. It's not in a 4-4 time signature. 20-minute songs don't usually go on the radio too well. Uh, if you read the lyrics to some of Rush's songs, in a word, they're polysyllabic. So Rush is cerebral music, right? It's not like Kiss, as Dave Grohl said when they were inducted to Foo Fighters. He was comparing Rush against Kiss. Kiss with songs like Love Pump. That's not really a Rush type of song. So Rush has been lambasted by the critics. I mean, some, if you watch the movie Beyond the Lighted Stage, it's actually hysterical to listen to what they say about the band. They're indulgent. The lead singer sounds like he's on helium. I mean, it's really mean stuff. Rolling Stone has not only ignored them, they've criticized them. However, despite this, Rush has made 12 studio albums, sold more than 45 million records, and they've inspired so many artists today, like the Foo Fighters, like Red Hot Chili Peppers, like Metallica. They're incredibly accomplished musicians, and they couldn't care less about what the experts thought. In fact, when Rush was inducted, in a way, it was vindication for us, because for years we had said, this is really good music. We don't care what the critics or the experts think. Please tell me you know who this guy is. <laughs> Stephen King. If you get bored one day, Google Stephen King rejection letters. In the early 70s, when King was trying to make it as a novelist, he didn't get rejection letters along the lines of, really good idea, but just not right for us. They were downright mean. Things like, you really need to consider another line of work. You will never publish anything, ever. The fact that you know who he is proves my point. His rejection letters, like I said, he, he would keep 
print, he wouldn't print them out, there really weren't printers back then, but he would just put them up on his wall to inspire them. And to, up to this point, when I was putting this together, I found that he sold more than 350 million copies of his books. They've been translated into movies, right, like Misery, or there's a new one coming out on CBS, a miniseries called Under the Dome. So again, Stephen King ignored the experts. This one's really obscure. This is Jack Canfield. And a bunch of years ago, he had this idea for a series of books called Chicken Soup for the Soul. Oh, yeah. And he pitched this to traditional publishers. And the traditional publishers all said, eh, right? No commercial viability. So he self-published, which as a writer I know is much easier to do today than it was 15 years ago. The first book sold, I believe, millions of copies and launched the entire series. There are now more than 100 million copies in print in 54 languages across the world. Mind-boggling. Again, publishers are experts. They're supposed to know what books are going to be successful. Well, someone didn't tell Stephen King and Jack Canfield. <laughs> These guys, bringing it back to business for a minute, you should absolutely know. Larry and Sergey in 1997 were at Stanford, and they're getting their PhDs. They really weren't thinking about changing the world. They were thinking about becoming doctorates, maybe professors. They had developed this search technology, and it was much better than existing search engines. I was around in the first days of the internet. Search was terrible. Lycos, Alta Vista, Yahoo. You would search and not get anything remotely close to what you wanted. It was absolutely terrible. So when Larry and Sergey came around, they said, yeah, this is good, but we really want to continue with our PhDs. They wanted to sell their technology for $1 million with an M. Right? Yahoo and Excite, if you remember Excite back in the day, <laughs> said, nah, you know what? We'll pass. Yahoo famously said, we're good with search. The future's all about the portal. And search doesn't really matter. So they rejected. Larry and Sergey's overtures. So they were sort of stuck with this technology and they almost backed into starting Google. Today, Google's worth what? $300 billion? Does anyone here, show of hands, not use Google? Right? Astonishing. So the experts were wrong. There was one other one about even if the experts were right, things can happen for different reasons. In 1994, after I graduated college, I worked at Sony Electronics. And they were working on the mini disc player. And it was, a, it was beautiful, right? It was more convenient than a CD. It was smaller. It was designed well. Product design was beautiful. It was marketed well. But it didn't go anywhere. Why? Now, because of Betamax, kind of, the internet happened. Why do I need a mini disc when I can have MP3s? So my point here is that the experts are always wrong about predictions. I can't tell you if you're writing a book or if you're starting a company that it will be successful or it won't. Really, nobody can. They may be right, they may be wrong. So just remember that next time an expert tells you that you don't know what you're doing and you won't go anywhere, they're usually at best 50-50. So I think we have time for questions. All right. Let's hear, let's hear it from Phil. All right, who's got the first question tonight? Now it's nighttime here. Oh, in the front and then back here. Are these these LED lights, Corey? Not, not yet, right? I love the examples that you had in your, in your talk. Um, do you consider yourself an expert? <laughs> we might be in a, in a total infinite loop here. So if I am an expert, then you should trust the experts because I'm just saying you shouldn't trust me. Um, I like to think that I can explain things, but there's a big difference. A, a book like one of the ones I showed was A Black Swan. Um, I like to think that I can understand what's going on, but I am absolutely terrible at predicting the future. Um, I remember watching Apple go from 400 to 500 to 600 to 700, and the analysts, people who had very good records, said it's going to be at 1100. So finally I said, damn it, I'm buying some, and I bought some at 675. Whoops. I'm actually convinced that if I did buy it, Apple would be at 1100. But to answer your question, um, I think that you can be knowledgeable about what you do. And, and the talks here today show me that people know what they're doing. But who knows what, what you'll be doing in five years, much less why. 
Uh, we like to isolate. We like books like Malcolm Gladwell, who's a phenomenal writer, but he has the benefit of hindsight. Just because something did work doesn't mean that it will work in the future. I'm most proud of my fourth book, The Age of the Platform, how Apple, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google have redefined business. I go out of my way in that book to say, I don't have a 10-point checklist for you to be the next Google. If Google started today, it wouldn't be the next Google. So there is so much serendipity involved. I think that it's great to have a plan, but you may not wind up following it. I, if I wanted to be a public speaker and a writer, there's absolutely no way I would have chosen my career path. I just sort of backed into it. So uh, probably an expert about what's happening now, but I, not so much for the future. Um, entre entrepreneurship um, is about risk management. So you want to keep your um, overhead um, low um, so that you can make uh, uh, be able to uh, pivot and make mistakes. Uh, what, what do you think? Sure. I moved to Vegas because I cut my cost of living in half from New Jersey. Mm -hmm. There's some, my, for the, I, run a, I run a small publishing company, and I've never met three of the four people who work with me uh, because they can be remote and take on other projects. So I completely agree with you. If you have a monthly nut of five or ten or fifteen thousand dollars, that really compromises what you can do. Peter Thiel's giving people $100,000 not to go to school, right? So they can start an idea and not graduate with a ton of debt. So if you can keep overhead low, I guess why, why wouldn't you? All right, who's got another question? Okay. Obviously, uh, we all have to think about what uh, the future may hold, given that you know you have to make preparations for things, you have to allocate, you have to make plans. So how do you go about that, n given the fact that you realize how uncertain things really are? Jerry Brown used to be the governor of California, and he's got one of my favorite quotes. Everyone likes to plan because no one has to do anything. I, I think that it's great to have a three or a five year plan, right? But so often that plan is, is ridiculous, right? And it's kind of a buzzword trying to pivot, but I try not to lock myself into something. A great example I found out researching the, um, the previous book. Jeff Bezos, when he started Amazon in 1994, said, I want to be the world's online, biggest online bookstore, right? Well, eventually, somebody, when they built these data centers in 2006 at Amazon, said, wait a minute, guys, we have all this compute power from these data centers, right? What if, instead of letting it evaporate into the ether and wasting it, we actually tried to sell it? Now, at a company like Microsoft, where the focus is very much on Windows and on Office, that person would have been laughed at, laughed at, right? But at Amazon, because of the culture, they said, wait a minute, that's actually a pretty good idea. Why don't we run with that? And it took them a couple years to get it right. I interviewed a guy from my third book, The New Small, who used Amazon Web Services early on. And he said it was clunky. You actually had to buy it in advance. It was like saying a gallon of milk. How much compute power do you need? Well, people don't think like that. How much electricity do you need in advance? How do you know? So it took them a while to get it right, but they were willing to experiment. You can't tell me, as smart as Jeff Bezos is, and I think the guy's a genius, there's no way that in 1994 he said, you know what, in 2006, we'll start this Amazon Web Services part of our business that will generate last year, by some estimates, $2.5 billion of essentially pure profit. So I think that it's great to have a plan, but if you stick with an intractable plan, you could miss out on enormous opportunities when they present themselves. That's a great point. Um, okay. <laughs> no follow up. <laughs> who's got a, Who's got another question here? In the front. Okay. Uh, goodness. Hi. <laughs> Hi, mom. Um, okay. Here we go. Hey, Phil. Great, great presentation. So we talked. You talked about you know when why you shouldn't listen to the experts. 50% of the time, is there anything you could say why you should listen to the experts, those other 50% perhaps? Or is why it really you should? Just, yeah, why you should, just to kind of turn it around. Is there any, any advice in that direction as well? I mean, the experts are sometimes right. And it's, I would argue that it makes sense. If you're betting the future of your company on something because an expert says so, then you, know, you're, you might as well play roulette, right? right? And if you understand that going in, I mean, you, you left your full-time job to start what you're doing. And God bless, it looks like you're doing great but you have to be prepared for that not to work out. So what kind of contingency do you have? A lot of people here are, are young, which is great. It's the best time to do something, right? Before, uh, I forget, somebody said before, the, the, partner, the partner, was it Lauren? 
uh, was it the partner wanted to um, start a family? Oh, that's me. Frank, right, yeah, you <laughs> perfect example, right? I completely understand. <laughs> it's me. Yeah. But I completely understand why your partner felt the way he did. It wasn't right or wrong, it was just different points of light. You had the passion, you started Tech Cocktail, and look where you are. Um, so uh, it doesn't hurt to listen to people who know what they're talking about, but just because something worked before doesn't necessarily mean that it would work in the future. So I just, I have a very healthy skepticism for experts. And if I can quote from Nate Silver for a second, it, his book is really very good. He thinks probabilistically, instead of this is going to happen or this is not going to happen, try to put some numbers around it. That's why he said, and he in, incurred the wrath of the right when he said a couple days before the election that Obama had a 90% chance of winning. A lot of people said, who the hell is this guy? The polls say it's 50-50, but that's popular vote. Silver, based on his models, was a lot more precise. And he said, I'm not saying Obama is going to win. I'm just saying, if you bet me even odds, I would take that bet every day of the week and twice on Sunday, because according to my model, it's 90% for him. So if you think probabilistically, it doesn't mean that you have to say, oh, I've got a 13.7% chance of succeeding at something. But you know, run some, some analysis, right? Say, well, I think we could have some kind of success. What's the downside? What am I investing? And then almost take the, uh, I should say, quantify the risk. I play a lot of poker. And there's a great saying in poker, trust the process, don't trust the outcome. If you do everything right in poker, you can still lose. You could be holding deuce seven and I've got aces and you crack my aces, but I played the hand right. Over time, if I consistently play poker well, then I will win, but on any given hand, I can lose. Now that's tough if you're an entrepreneur. So sometimes I, I hear about people starting two or three different things. That can be tough to do at the same time, but I like to throw numbers around things. I know that if I have a, a, a good cover for my book and I hire a PR firm, and I network like hell, and I do speaking events, there's a good chance that my book will do better than if I don't, but that guarantees nothing. So uh, someone said before, I love the line, we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I actually said that at the, um, uh, was it the uh, Inspire event recently. So I completely agree with that. If you think that there's certainty out there, you're probably going to be wrong, right? That's a great point. Um, sums it up, right? You're Answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, who's got another question? Oh, hold up. You gotta get a mic. So, uh, given the odds now that Sir Howard is gone, is uh, what are the odds that Sony's back? Sully. Sony. Do you work? You work for Sony. Oh, I oh I did back in '94. What are the odds that what comes back? Now that Sir Howard Stringer is gone, that Sony's back. I'm sorry, still, I still couldn't hear the question. That, that Sony is back in business. Well, they're still around, but they're floundering, and they used to be completely dominant. So if you look at, I saw someone uh, earlier today had the book Good to Great by Jim Collins. Uh, most of the books that I enjoy, like The Halo Effect, really call that into question. Because uh, when he wrote Good to Great, he looked at 30 companies and said, they were doing these things. If you do these 30 things, then you'll be successful. Except two years later, something like 12 out of those 30 companies had lost market cap. He actually had to write a book called How the Mighty Fail to <laughs> explain how, well, sort of doesn't exactly. So you can do everything by the book. Vince Gilligan from Breaking Bad has an absolutely fantastic quote. Maybe we should end on it. He talks about Breaking Bad. He said, if you're trying to create a great screenplay, learn how to do it and then ignore it all. Right? That's how you get something that's pure art. That's how you get something that's so different and bizarre and weird. It's, Breaking Bad is anything but anodyne. Some people watch it and they say, it's a little too close to home because I had someone who had cancer or it's a little too intense for me. And I totally get that. But if you want to do something great, I think it's very difficult to follow a, a checklist or a set of rules. I used to write for Inc. Magazine, and there was always this tension because they would say, Phil, we like numbers. Go to Inc.com. I'll bet you a Coke that six of the ten top posts have a number in them. Right? It's great for SEO. But I can do the five things that I should do to write a best-selling book. I can pretty much guarantee you that's not going to happen. So those types of things I tend to view very um, suspiciously. Uh, like I said, I have a healthy skepticism, but you're never going to know unless you try. And I applaud all of you for taking the risk. It's, it's tough. I, sometimes I wonder myself, wouldn't it be great if I had a regular paycheck, a full-time job, benefits, a paid vacation, right? Wow. Ultimately, I come back to my passion, though, and the fact that I enjoy writing and speaking and being able to take risks or take naps or play golf in the afternoon. So 
I try to stay true to myself, but it's tough um, sometimes. And uh, I think it was Chuck who said you guys had pivoted two or three times, um, at least. So I try to keep my eyes open to different possibilities because I can't guarantee that I'll still be writing in five years. I think there'll still be a publishing, publishing industry. I think there'll still be books. But something else may come around that intrigues me or maybe I want to pursue. And that's the benefit to me of being an entrepreneur. And in Vegas, with what's going on here, you have so many resources. It's great to be able to you know, learn something from someone on WordPress, go to a meetup, talk to somebody, uh, knowing they're experts and maybe they're wrong. But it's still, I think, great to know that there are other people also trying to make it. Because it's very difficult. And kudos to you for, for trying. I'm good. All right. It's here for Phil. Thank you.